Hey there, it's Nick Turzo, and this is The Radical Podcast. No, we won't be overthrowing any governments, but we will be learning from radical creatives who rule the world. Welcome back to this week's show. My guest today is musician and producer Richard Fortis. Richard is best known as a member of Guns N' Roses. Besides being a virtuoso guitar player, Richard is also a songwriter and producer. He recently produced the new Psychedelic Furs record, Made of Rain, which debuted at number 13 on the Billboard charts. He has a remarkable acumen and pedigree as a musician and is equally comfortable with the hustle it takes to be a successful musician, songwriter, and producer. Up next, my conversation with Richard Fortis. Hello, Richard Fortis. Hello, Nick Turzo. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I miss you. I haven't seen you in ages. Uh, I feel the same, my friend. But you're, uh, you know, other than this year, you're a touring dog. So I don't know where I would see you. Uh, on the road, like on everybody the road. else. <laughs> <laughs> so how is, uh, uh, seeing that that has been your life the last few years, how, how, how is this quarantine treating you and actually being in one spot? Uh, it's been a real blessing for me personally. Um, and I know I, I feel a little guilty saying that, uh, as I know there's a lot of people really struggling, but, uh, I've been really fortunate in that I've been working a lot and it's been really great to be home for me and to be working from home and being with my family and, dealing with family issues and stuff like that. So it's uh, it's really been great because I don't know how I would have survived this. I'd actually be doing the last show of a tour today, of the U.S. tour. We were supposed to be in the U.S. Um, now, we already, we were going to, I was just starting a South American tour. So that was like a 10-week tour. Then we came home for a week and then went to Europe for two months and then came home and immediately started the States. Um, and then I would just be finishing now. So I would have been gone this entire time and, uh, man, it would, I don't know how I would have, I don't know how we would have gotten through that. I just, I, I can't imagine, um, with all that we've been through and personal, you know, with personal things with my family and health things and, uh, I don't know how we would have gotten through it. So mm. it's it's worked out really well for me and fortunately, knock on wood, I've uh, I've had so much work coming in just doing sessions, recording sessions and things like that. So uh I've been busy every day and trying to work my way through this pile of stuff I've got in front of me. Nice, nice. Um so your year would have been eaten up totally by touring. How many times have they now uh, attempted to reschedule this stuff for like next year? <laughs> we rescheduled South America for next month, which isn't going to happen. <laughs> so, you know, it's uh, for, sorry, October, I think November. Um, but that's not going to happen now because uh, South America is in a similar situation to where we are. Um. Are those so, festival dates, Richard? Are those primarily your own arena, your own stadium dates? How do you combination of both? Got it. And I think we did the last show on Earth, which was in Mexico City. Wow! In how, March, how many then, people was that? I think it was like eighty thousand. <laughs> Not one wearing a mask. Fantastic. Yeah, we we thought we were going to walk out and there's going to be a stadium full of masks, but. No. Wow. That is crazy. So you're kind of a, uh, a native uh, of St. Louis, yes? Yes. And you still reside there? And can, I do. Can... Well, I moved back about 10 years ago. Um, I lived in L.A. for a few years. And before that, I was, as you know, I was in New York for, well, in fact, I'm closing on my, I'm selling my apartment in New York this week. You still had your apartment in New York? Yeah. Wow. Good for you. Give up. Yeah. I, you know, I, I always had, it, it always 
it still feels like home to me. Like I feel more at home in New York than I do in St. Louis, but I I had to let it go. <laughs> it just didn't make sense anymore. Yeah, well, I think it's, you know, everyone's debating it this week, right, between Seinfeld and El Chucher and about, you know, is the city changed forever and will it come back? And, you know, the debates are raging about New York City right now. It's still the greatest city in the world. I mean, it's uh, it's a bit of a mess, but yeah, I think it will. I think it will come back. Yeah, I think that's fair. So in St. Louis, you... Uh, Obviously, you were raised there, had a, a nice childhood. Um, you attended like the Conservatory of the Arts there. Is that where you kind of went to school or partial yeah, well, school? I went, I went to uh, high school at a place called Visual and Performing Arts, which is, you know, one of those fame schools <laughs> that uh, like they have in New York. You know, it's like a high school for the arts. It's a um, public school in a magnet school. So I, I went downtown every day, you know, to go to school, to high school. And then went to the Conservatory of the Arts. And was the attraction music even when you went to that high school or was it more? Yeah. Yeah, it was you all. You knew it was music. Yes. And were you multi-instrumentalist or are you just kind of, I'm going to be a guitar god like I turned out? Or were you much more uh, of a multi-instrumentalist? No, I was still, I mean, violin was still my, sort of my bread and, bread and butter, you know, because that's what I started on. Mm. And so I was playing violin and all the, youth symphonies and the uh school string ensembles and uh and then playing guitar as well but yeah i guess guitar really didn't i didn't get into guitar till i was about 12 13 but then i got i got good quickly because i had the dexterity in my left hand was i had the finger strength and you know already there so how Natural damn progression. hard is it to learn to play a violin? I mean, <laughs> or, uh, you know, it's interesting because I was always very intimidated. I started on violin when I was about four or five, and I was always very intimidated by guitar because there were six strings. It was, you know, the polyphony, the uh, polyphonic element of it, um, whereas violin tends to be more. Uh, I, you can, I mean, it's, it's basically one note at a time, you know, as opposed to six strings at a time with guitar. Chords so it's, versus it's notes. Mo yeah, it's mono, you know, it's monophonic. So you know, you're playing one note or two notes, sometimes more, but you know, for the most part, it's single note lines. Um, and that I had my hands full with. So, you know, I, I was pretty intimidated by, and, and also the, the length of the neck. And, uh, it just seemed very daunting because there were always guitars around my house. Cause my father was in, though my father was an accountant. He worked for a musical instrument company. Who did he work for? Like what musical, you a mean company, a retailer or a manufacturer? No, a, a manufacturer, um, a, a company called St. Louis music. Hmm. Yeah. They made uh Ampeg and, uh, and crate and alvarez oh wow yeah oh i didn't know that was there yep so i oh. grew up in that company got it so there were plenty of amps around at least <laughs> well plenty of uh yeah there were always guitars around the house nice so yeah and also i was you know influenced by the people that were around him you know the guys that worked in his warehouse and you know, that I would, because I would work there on summers. So, you know, I was hanging out with all these great players. And how did, I mean, did that help shift? I mean, how did you find your, um, whatever, your musical inspiration or the spark that led you kind of more to rock and roll and stuff and pop music versus kind of more classical? Um, I think I was about eight or nine when, you know, I was, I also played drums growing up. Um, until about 12, uh, I guess until I was about 14, I was predominantly a drummer when it came to secular music, if you will, <laughs> when it came to, uh, <laughs> to rock and roll. And I, you know, I inherited my aunts, my aunt became a born again Christian and gave me all of her albums when I was about eight or nine. 
And so I inherited all the Beatles catalog, the Stones, you know, the first couple of Black Sabbath records, Humble Pie, like all this great stuff. Um, and that's, and I just absorbed all of that. So that's, I, I obsessed over that record collection and started going to hang out at record stores. And, you know, so yeah, that started my obsession. Right. And was that her just exercising those evil musical tastes out of her life when she became born again? Or was that to well, give you course. an education? <laughs> of course that, no, that's what you do when you become born again. You, uh, yeah, you exercise all those demon, demonic, all the demonic music in your life, I guess. I don't know. That's wild. So, so and was it so corrupted my youth. Fantastic. Yeah. So, I mean, God who were kind of what were <laughs> what were like the seminal like artists for you back then? Like, what really turned uh, you on back then? Oh man, everything. Because you know, I used to. It, it's funny because I just saw that Cream documentary. Yeah, I didn't see it on on the magazine Cream, and. I loved that magazine growing up. I mean, that was like, because my father's company would advertise in all these magazines. So I would go in and on Saturdays and go through all the magazines that they would get, like Cream and Hit Parader and uh, Crawdaddy and Circus and read those from cover to cover. I mean, I, they were like my Bible, um, not to... Not to lose track of the uh, religious theme here, so I would uh, I I I read those voraciously, and would then seek out the music. And if it, Cream was such an amazing resource because it really was so focused on the fringe music, you know, there was a lot of stuff about the Ramones and when punk came out, you know, and, um, and I was a little kid when the sex pistols happened and the Ramones and I was reading about all these bands and then I'd go, you know, to the record store and listen to them. Um, and you know, back then I, you could only buy like, I, first of all, I only bought used albums, right. Um, for the most part. And so I would go to vintage vinyl, and scour the bins, you know, and uh, try, and they let you listen to stuff. So I had listened to all the punk rock stuff, but they also, you know, Cream also focused on bands like uh, the Stooges and um, Mitch Ryder because I, I didn't realize it at the time, but they were based in Detroit. Um, so MC5, all that man, it, it like hit me to all of that stuff. And which explains a lot about sort of my earliest influences, you know? Right. So, so you, you graduate from the high school. I mean, are you going to this conservatory of the arts simultaneously or is that something yeah, after I high school? Do, no, I was actually doing it simultaneously. Um, cause I was studying classical guitar there and as well as violin. So, uh, yeah. So in high school, I'm, Really, when I first start high school, I start, I'm really into older rock and roll. So, you know, at that time, I wasn't into Poison. I wasn't into Motley Crue and, uh, all you know, Ozzy Osbourne, stuff like that. You know, I love the first Sabbath record. I loved uh, older music. So, you know, early Genesis and Yes and uh, King Crimson and the stones and Jethro Tull. Like I was into all that sort of art rock type of stuff. T-Rex, um, you know, all that, that whole scene. So that's where my focus was, um, until I heard the clash and then sort of everything changed for me. And I was probably 14, 15. I just started high school. Hmm. And awesome. so I went from that whole art rock scene straight into, and with the art rock scene came all the, the jazz fusion bands, you know, and being a musician, I was attracted to all of that. So, you know, for, um, uh, Ma Vishnu Orchestra and LA Express and, uh, um, Spira Gyra and Jeff Beck, like that stuff was very appealing to me return to forever um and then uh, again then i heard the clash and then it it 
everything shifted. So now in, I was hiding because I was playing all of that stuff. I was really, you know, as a player, that's where I was focused. So, you know, keeping getting my chops up and woodshedding and stuff like that. And then I heard the clash and it was like, oh, okay, this is all about attitude and not about playing. And so it then became sort of not letting on that you could play and using your chops in a more interesting way um, that were more structured about this around the song and not about being masturbatory with your playing. Right. Well, that's a wide breadth of <laughs> influences, which is interesting, which makes you who you are today. Um, did you um, ever do the high school thing and like, oh, I'm going to form a band now? Yeah. When I was my freshman year, I'm, I uh, started playing with some guys and met this singer that went to my school and we became friends and had a love of, we had a mutual love of older rock, you know, like I was saying, the more the art rock stuff. Um, so we started playing together and then we all sort of got into the police and the damned and the clash and bands like that. So started writing songs and that became my first band which is the band that I signed to Atlantic with. What um, was that called, called? Pale Divine. It was actually called The Eyes, uh, but there was obviously an English band called The Eyes from the 60s, um, which we didn't know about. Um, so then we changed our name. We got signed and changed our name to Pale Divine, put out one record on Atlantic. Um, Jason Fong signed St. Louis, this. Or did you go to, is that what we, got you to New York? No, we were based in St. Louis and we had a huge Midwest following. So we would play, it was like this cult following and we would play, we'd play, you know, thousand seat venues in St. Louis. And then we'd play Columbia, Missouri. We'd play the Blue Note in Columbia. We'd play in Chicago. We'd play in Indianapolis. We'd play in uh, Kansas City and all the college towns, Springfield. And, you know, like, and we were pushing out further and further um playing colleges and expanding our midwest base um and then we were attracting a lot of attention because we were drawing big crowds so labels started to pay attention and um we signed with Jason Flom to Atlantic which we were not at all like anything else Jason had we were sort of you weren't Skid Row. <laughs> we were anything but Skid Row. We were we were anti Row. Um, so we actually got shifted over to. He wasn't really that. Sh he knew something was going on and that he wanted to be a part of it, but he didn't really get it. And uh, then Peter Kopke sort of championed us and. Uh, we got moved over to Atco East West during that whole merger thing. And, uh, how many records did you, did you do one or we two? We did or? one record and mm. we toured supporting the psychedelic furs. Ah, so I halfway through the tour, they found out that I played cello and violin and asked me to start playing with them if I would come up and play on a few songs. So I did. And uh, then after that tour, you know, my band had been trying to get, you know, we'd been writing and sending demos to our label, who at that time, the head of the label was Sylvia Roan. Um, anyways, we, uh, I, I, Butler called me, Richard Butler called me and said, hey, would you be interested in coming up to New York and working with me to write this solo record that I'm going to do? So I started going up to New York during the week and flying back to St. Louis on weekends to play gigs with my band. And eventually uh, just gave up on that and moved up to New York full time. And that, that became Love Spit Love. Right. And how did you like, how would you have rated um, your ability like as a songwriter? How did your songwriting format or form 
um, kind of during that period, uh, nascently, or I mean, yeah, I mean, well, we, you know, it's funny. I was talking to the singer the other day of that band, and I remember we were about sixteen, seventeen years old, and we'd been playing quite a bit, and you know, we would write songs, you know, the, and put them in the set occasionally, but it was like a mixture of like you know, alternative band covers and our own stuff. And, you know, we were playing underage clubs and stuff like that. And I guess we were about 16, 17. And I was like, you know, REM was really popular. And I was like, man, we can write songs like this in our sleep. And so we sat down and wrote a bunch of songs and that became our first album. And, uh, and that's what got the attention of labels and stuff like that. So. It just sort of happened, and, and you know, I always studied stru- song structure. I always found that fascinating. So I would sit in front of MTV and write down all the song structures and look for similarities in songs that I liked. You know, it's things Smart. like that. Smart. Sort of analytical. Pattern and, recognition. Yeah. 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 And so did it intimidate you in a way? Because, I mean, look, Richard, with the Psychedelic Furs at the time, had huge top 40 hits and stuff. Was there any intimidation, like, in kind of collaborating? Or did you just step you right know, up? Because I've got a great foundation musically. I'm good. Uh, yeah, I think I, you know, I, I thought a lot of myself at the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as you, do, as you do when you're in your early 20s, you know? You do, you do. And you're in a rock band and you've had some level of success, even though it's, it, you know, the Furs were one of my favorite bands and Richard was always one of my favorite singers. Amazing singer. Yeah. So, you know, I I saw them for the first time when I was 15 and, uh, was just completely blown away by them. Um, and it's funny because the Divinals were opening for them on that tour. And I ended up, I ended up doing their last album before Mm -hmm. Chrissy passed. Oh, the wow. Divinals. I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, wow. With Charlie Drayton and Chrissy. That's wild. So, so you're in New York. I mean, it was your primary thing. I mean, at the time I met you, I met you, I guess, around that time. I mean, is Love Spit Love your primary thing? Are you still doing like a bunch of sessions, both playing and writing? Or what are you doing was, in New York? Yeah. Well, you know, that was Love Spit Love was definitely my, that was my main thing. At first. And as soon as I got to New York, because of my association with the Furs and with Butler, it sort of gave me entry into this world um, that and credibility to where I was, you know, getting calls for sessions and being asked to play with different people. And it just happened really quickly and organically in that way. And started to develop relationships with different producers, with different music houses, different studios. So I would get a lot of calls. Um, And that just sort of grew and grew. And eventually was doing, uh, I started my own company doing TV music, you know, commercials and uh, TV show themes and stuff like that. Interesting. Did you, um, I mean, as you look back today, I mean, as you sit today, do you have more of an interest in kind of the session work or being a producer like you are, or is it touring still do something for you in a big way? Uh, they, yeah. I mean, both, you know, it's nice after being on the road so much for the last 10 years, but especially the last five years have been really busy. Um, since Slash and Duff came back into the band. Um, it's, it's nice to be home and recording every day, like wake up, go for a run, take a shower and start working, you know, um, that's been really great. And also being able to sort of dig through all of the, uh, gear that I've been collecting for the last five years and accumulating, (laughs) being able to go and use all of it now, you know, which has been, yeah, it's been great. So, and it's, it's so much fun for me. I mean, I love being creative and, and, I'm writing with different people. I'm doing sessions where I'm playing on other people's stuff. So people are sending me tracks and I'm just sitting in my studio and working. And I suppose that's obviously all done remotely now for sure, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Is that and made it, it is that it made has it okay? Been for a while. Or, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've been doing it that way. But, you know, for the last uh ten years, most of the stuff that I've been doing, you know, I'd say probably eighty percent of the sessions that I've done over the last ten years have been done at my own studio. That's great. Yeah. Um, no, so- I, it's, it's I've been very fortunate because a lot of my friends that are touring musicians or that are musicians that don't have a studio or don't know how to engineer are really in a difficult position right now, you know, yes. and I've been fortunate that I do have that ability and I have the gear and I have the, uh, everything I need to be able to do those sessions. So in New York, uh, you're with Richard love spit love. How many records did you do? Did you with Maverick? I remember doing one with you myself. How many yeah. were there? We did one at Maverick. So we did two Love Spit Love albums. The first one was for um uh Imag- Imago on on uh BMG, right? Terry Ellis's company. Yep. yep. So that was the first record, and then the second one we did for for Maverick. And toured extensively on those. But I know you from the Evil Empire. Yes, you know me the, from the, the Death the Death Star. <laughs> <laughs> it was the Death Star. <laughs> <laughs> the Sony years. Oh. Uh, so so Richard and you were together for the like how long did you kind of really concentrate on Love Spit Love? Almost a decade? Yeah, I guess so. Um and during that time I was doing a lot of other stuff. I mean, like I was saying, I was mainly doing sessions. And it was hard for me to do tours at that time because I was making so much money just doing session work, it it was hard to justify leaving and touring, you know? Right. Um, Well, and if if you were doing a bunch of sync stuff too for film and TV, right? You just... That's predominantly what I was doing. You were building a great library, then yes. And you have to keep feeding it. Right, right. And I was scoring, you know, we were doing a lot of TV commercials and, you know, that's, you've got to be in New York for that. And for some reason, you know, now it's, now it's a totally different game. You know, the industry's changed so much. You know, uh, there's no way I could still be doing that in New York because people don't make records in New York because people don't have budgets. And film music and TV music, like commercials, you know, it's it, it's a minuscule fraction of what it used to be, you know, as far as money. Um, now, there's everybody has a studio in their house and everybody's doing music for very little money and, and underbidding each other. Right. Well, and it's, you know, it's kind of sad in a way, cause I think it's the, everyone's just kind of launched out of New York now. Right. Cause there's not that creative community really bond anymore. So, I mean, maybe that's why being here in Nashville, you know, maybe there's a little bit more of that now because people can come down here. There's a certain affordability level and there's kind of a community here. Right. But I think New York's been, you know, kind of decimated that way, at least, you know, with the creative, the clubs not existing anymore to even play anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. It, there's no studios. I mean, yeah. You know, I still work there occasionally, up, you know, but all the studios are in Brooklyn. Um, yeah. It's a very different vibe. And, but all the people I knew, all my friends that were making a killing doing sessions, uh, they don't do that anymore. I mean, nobody does. That. Everyone, the only way to make money is to tour. And obviously, there's none right. of that going on. <laughs> Right. So do you, um, you know, but so music, after the love, go ahead. No, but music has no value anymore. You know, there's, uh, it's so difficult to make a living writing or recording music because you can't, there's no real value to it. Yeah, it's, and that's true. That is true. Uh, I think, you know, look, streaming's done certainly something to it to, 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 I guess maybe it more commoditized it in a way, because you can track it and measure it. And, you know, it's become a little bit more of an asset. That's why you can see a lot of this private equity guys coming in now to buy these assets because they're measurable. Right. Um, So there's an interesting increase in value to your music catalog based on streaming, though. That's the weird part. But you have to have a a catalog that's worth something. Uh, Right, right. But so there's a kind of a disconnect. You know what I mean? I think. Yeah. A little bit. Kind of like America as a whole. Um, exactly, exactly. But, you know, we used to, uh, it, I mean, it's completely upside down from what it used to be. I mean, where, where 
when you and I started, you would put out records and then you would tour to promote the records. And now you put out albums to promote a tour. Right. Yeah. It, it's definitely a lost leader, so to speak. Yeah. So, so you did. So Love Spit Love, you guys go at it for a while. Then you kind of move on. Was there bands in between that and GNR? Or how, what, well, what, what I went mean, on do in you, that period? you remember I did Honky Toast. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. So that, uh, you know, we, we would, that was a band of friends basically that we would just play together for fun in, uh, around New York city. And it was a very sort of like an in joke and very New York, you know, the whole character of Eric toast. And, uh, it, it was a lot of fun. And a lot of my friends, you know, would, uh, who were a lot of our mutual friends that were junior A and R guys, and they'd all come out and, you know, it just sort of became this thing. And we ended up, signing this ridiculously big record deal that nobody should have given us. And <laughs> who, who, who gave you that? <laughs> well, we ended up, I mean, man, it was down to, I mean, every major label bid on that band. Uh, and it was down at the end, it was down to DreamWorks to Goldstone. Mm -hmm. um, and then Polly Anthony at, at Epic. Yep. And Sylvia Roan from Electro. And well, they would all throw down. That's for sure. Well, then it was then Goldie checked out. He was like, man, this is this deal is ridiculous. I, can, I can't keep up with this. And it became the war of the women. So <laughs> it was it, it, they kept leapfrogging each other. And, you know, Son, David Sonnenberg was managing us. And uh, the deal, you know, it was a, so it was a big deal. He, he knew how to drive a deal up. So. Yeah. Did, um, but I mean, it was, it was doomed. So. And what'd you do? One record? One record. And how'd it do? It didn't do anything. Not I mean, no, nobody got the joke outside of New York, which, <laughs> which I sort of figured, you know, I mean, I, it, it, but we did the record with Andy Johns and that was a lot of fun. Um, and I learned a lot from that, even though, uh, boy, we were a mess at that time. In, in what way? In what regard? You mean uh, just, just with drugs substances? And, yeah. Yeah. That's not good. Yeah, but, you know. It happens. It, yeah, it happens, and it came and went, and, yeah. And so after that, then, you kind of, is that when the Guns N' Roses thing kind of popped into well, your world or not? Uh, I was doing, I was actually, I mean, I'd been touring with the Furs again, and then I actually went out with uh, Enrique Iglesias when he was, like, at his hugest. Oh, wow. Um, like, you know, hero and all that stuff you know so i was around that for that year two years um doing that tour and in the middle of that tour i'd gotten a call to come audition for gnr actually it was the second time i'd gotten a call um the first time i was in new york and they called me and said we asked if i'd be interested in auditioning and i was going to be out there doing a record with uh for an artist in la so we were going to, I was said, sure, I'll come out and do, you know, I'm going to be out there in two weeks. I'll, you know, we could do it then. And so we were all set up and then, uh, it ended up not happening. Like a couple of days before I left, I couldn't get a hold of anybody. So I just figured, you know, in typical GNR fashion, you know, things, things changed. <laughs> so, uh, I get out to LA to do the session and Tommy Stinson and Josh Freeze were on the session. And I was, which was ironic. And I'm like, Hey, I was supposed to actually come and audition for you guys this week. And they're like, Oh, you're the guy from New York. And they say, Oh yeah. Axel found this guy Buckethead and caught off all the auditions. So cut to two years later. Well, you know, Tommy and I went out that night and became best friends. Like we just, you know, the replacements were always one of my favorite bands. Like I saw them first time I saw them, I think I was 14 or 15 and they were opening for X. Yeah. That would make and, sense. It's two good Midwestern boys bonded. Yeah. So we hit it off and, uh, and, you know, did a bunch of other stuff together. And then, um, next time guns needed somebody, they called me and I, so that's, I was on tour in Europe with Enrique Iglesias and, um, I flew, we did two or three shows at Royal Albert Hall 
And then on the last show, I had a car waiting, got off stage, jumped in the car, flew to Los Angeles because we had two days off, did the audition, stayed up all night talking to Axel, got back on a plane and flew back to Europe. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, and, brutal. And check this out. So I, at the airport at LAX, I'm sitting there waiting for my flight. I'd been up for like 30 something hours straight. And I'm sitting at the airport waiting for my plane. And this guy comes up to me and goes, excuse me, sir. He goes, are you, are you who I think you are? I'm like, probably not. And he said, <laughs> you're not Izzy Stradlin. <laughs> 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 Which nobody had ever, ever said that to me in my life. And I sort of look around thinking I'm being punked. <laughs> yeah, right. And, uh, and I said, no, I'm not. But I think I just took his job. And, uh, yeah, that, that, uh, That's hilarious. that was a really strange thing. So, so then you go back and finish with Enrique. Yeah. You know, Axel had said, he goes, you know, we're going to start rehearsals in two weeks. And I said, man, I can't start in two weeks. And he looked at me like, are you fucking crazy? And, but I was like, I'm, I'm in the middle of this tour and I can't leave the tour. And he started to get pissed off. And then he thought about it and he goes, okay. We'll wait for you because I know you won't do it to me. Mm. And uh, yeah, so that was 18 years ago. Wow. And what was your first experience with them? I mean, was it just going out on a, on a tour versus recording uh, anything? Yeah, no. Well, I don't remember if I did some recording before. I don't think so. I think we went straight out on tour. Um, and this is with Buckethead. Um, so Bucket and Robin Fink. Brain was playing drums mm. and Tommy. And we went to, eight, I think we started in Asia and did that, then did some dates in Europe and then came back. I mean, and, see, have they always made, has GNR always maintained like a stadium level? I mean, or no, was no, there a we point were, that they were in arenas or smaller venues? Yeah, we were playing arenas. And then for a while we were doing, you know, like we did a residency at the Hard Rock in Vegas. Um, but yeah, it was it was usually arenas. And did that did you bond with that kind of group of players? Was that good Oh for yeah. You? I mean it was it, it was great. I mean Ro I love Robin. Uh I loved his playing. I love working with him. Um and obviously Tommy's like my brother. Um and yeah, we were all very tight. I mean, and then there was Bucket, um, who was just sort of out on his own. But it was very musical, and uh, it was exciting to be a part of. Mm, I think, um, I think and, someone signed Buckethead when I was at Columbia. <laughs> yeah, I think he did get a deal at Columbia for a minute. He did. So, boy, I David Kahn signed him. Who you know, David was kind of like Paul McCartney's producer yeah, now, and yeah. So David signed. <laughs> he's a phenomenal talent. Yep. Um, he, man, he's a, he's pretty out there. Yeah. So was we that definitely. Definitely I mean, be difficult to work with. I mean, I, I enjoyed working with him because he was he's very musical and he understood, you know, it's a difficult dynamic to make three guitars work. Mm, yeah. Tell and, me about that a little bit. Well, he did an excellent job because he would he understood the dynamics of it and where the puzzle, how the puzzle pieces have to fit together. And Bucket really understood that um, and where everything sort of has to have its place and then when he left and uh um ron thaw came in um it it was a different dynamic because i think ron had been used to playing like sort of doing his own thing with his own band and sort of didn't really get how that worked you know or how to make it work so it 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 was difficult at that time I mean, does Axel play the roles of the ultimate musical director for GNR? Or, or does one yeah. of you guys step up as a musician and say, I'm kind of the band leader? Uh, you know, a lot of it was was Tommy. Um, and he had sort of been somehow put in that role. Um, and then, you know, Axel was the, uh, always the final arbiter, you know? I'd imagine. Yeah. That's the case. And then was it... Was it uncomfortable in any way like when the original some of the original guys came back like duff and and um flash or not 
I didn't, I wasn't uncomfortable in, in any way. In fact, it, it was very, you know, it, it was, it was a little bit, you know, you're cautious at first, you know, you don't want to step on anybody's toes. Everyone's sort of, you know, feeling each other out. And, uh, you know, Duff and I had worked together before and were friends and, uh, it, it fell together really quickly and very naturally. And, you know, I think we have so much musical background in common uh, as far as like where we came from and the bands that we sort of grew up listening to and the progression of our musical interests um you know with the whole background in um older music and then punk rock and you know our love for the stones and you know it it sort of gelled but as far as like with slash and i it really came together very naturally in a really um easy way did it uh, that explains kind of you guys, the other players. I mean, how did that work? Like their history between the three of them as original guys, and they all kind of gel together easily enough again, or does yeah, that just take some absolutely. time? Absolutely. No, that happened right in the pocket. Yeah. Instantly. That's awesome. Yeah. I have not seen you guys. So I, I, I have not seen uh, guns and roses play since, uh, the whiskey in Los Angeles. Wow. <laughs> Uh, yeah I i've think never you're seen in, him in I a think, big venue wow you're uh you're one of the few people that hasn't seen us <laughs> i know i feel like a little a little weird about it but you know because i've gotten to know duff just a little bit not really well because of the seattle thing you know being part of my right crew. right crew um, but i've never seen guns and roses play a large venue i've only seen them when they were on the strip man out the first that's one of my that's one of my favorite people Nice guy. Really, really just, uh, just a great dude. Just yeah. so much fun to hang out with and, uh, and to talk to yeah. very smart. Um, yeah, I, I, it, it, this is sort of a dream scenario for me. And, you know, I'm playing with in that I'm playing with guys that all take it as seriously as I do and, uh, are as committed and dedicated. And that's, really rare and uh awesome to be a part of that's great does who who drums is frank drum who drums yeah. for frank yeah. does, huh? and that's that was crazy. i think that was the toughest fit um when those guys came back is you know for duff well for both of them you know sort of adapting to frank and trying to get him to adapt to them you know mm. it wasn't as natural Right. But uh but has you know ended up working out well. Oh, he's a hell of a drummer, so I'm glad mm -hmm. <laughs> it should work out. So yeah. and, if, and I mean, does that take a huge chunk of your time when they're active? I mean, do you have time where you're inactive for like a year at a time where you can go do other things or how does that <sighs> not, break out? Not really. Um no, there hasn't been a whole lot of not you know, since since those guys came back into the band, it's been straight through. It's been very busy. Oh. So it's been hard to uh, do anything else. You know, I did manage to produce the Furs album. Um, a new one, right? The new one? Yeah, it just came out a couple of weeks ago. And that was uh, very time consuming for me. It's something that I put a lot of time into. And that I was doing... And fortunately, man, I'm so lucky that they asked me to do it and then were willing to work around my schedule. And, you know, I'd just come back from like six months on the road and they wanted to start recording. And my wife was like, why don't you do it in St. Louis? Because you haven't been home for six months. And it made sense because it's central and they're the that band is all over the country. You know, there's one in New York, there's one in Chicago, there's one in uh, Kentucky, there's one in California. It just made sense mm. um, that we convene in uh, the middle of the country. Um, so we did it here and we would track for like two weeks at a time and then I'd go back out on the road, they'd go back out on the road and then we did another two weeks and then ended up cutting vocals in New York and then recut the vocals here at my house. Um, you know, so it's, it was a long process cause it was very interrupted, but, mm. uh, but I put a lot of time into it. Um, 
sort of tweaking things on my own and uh, working on the tracks for a lot of time when I was home. I got to get my my ears in gear and uh, listen to that record. I've been meaning to. I haven't I'm done really it yet. proud of it. I'm really proud of it. And the reviews have been fantastic. And it charted. It's the it charted at number 13, which is, I think, the highest chart position they've had, uh, with the exception of um, Midnight to Midnight, when that came out. That's great. Congratulations. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I'm excited about it. And I wrote a couple of songs on it. And yeah, I'm going to have to try to convince Sir Butler to come talk to me at some point here. So uh, I you absolutely should. So. Man, cool. uh, have you had any? Uh, you you were at Columbia when they were on Columbia, right? No, that was before me. Oh, was it? Yeah, I'm a little um, younger than that. So yeah, I guess don't, so. Don't make me so old. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so we've, uh, we're going to wrap up here because we're kind of getting up on time. So is there? Um, so you did the Furs record, which is fantastic. I mean, you're waiting out future touring plans. Yeah, um, right now we've got dates scheduled for next summer. Yeah, that makes sense. I think I think it's a safe bet. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, hopefully, the you know the rest of the world is looking pretty good, with the exception of South America. Um, it's just the U.S. and South America that are. But if if we get a vaccine and people actually take it, which seems to be a real issue here in the country, this country, uh, then we should be able to you know, hopefully be up and running by summer, I would think. Yeah, I think that's, that is a safe bet. So, um, so aside from the Psychedelic Furs record, which you're proud of, that you, what are you listening to currently that's great? Is there something you're really into right now? Uh, you know what, I, I've, I've been listening to uh, mainly classical stuff like uh, Penderecki and uh, like film scores like by Toro Takamitsu. Um, there hasn't been a lot. I, that's sort of been my focus lately, uh, as well as, I mean, Bernard Herrmann, stuff like that. That's what I, I've i sort of been focusing on because I've been doing more orchestral stuff because um, I'm working on some stuff with Richard again, um, with Richard Butler. Got it. And it's more along that line. So that's where my head's at right now. And that's sort of all I've been listening to. Interesting. That, that I, news. <laughs> yeah, well, stay off the news. That's a, that, that's a drain. Man, energy. I can't. I can't. It's this. Uh, it, it's this. It, it, it's this rubbernecking thing that I just can't seem <laughs> to break myself. It, and it really has affected me. You know, the last few years, and, and all of us, uh, it, it, Axel as well. You know, I mean, I I text with him all every day um, about current events. Yeah, and I'm surprised just, at his politicalization that he's kind of taken here. He's really taken a stand. I'm surprised by that. It's, it, you know, it's, it's really just baffling. You know, I don't, it, it amazes me. It's like, you know, for, for us that spent so much time in New York, you know, people like that, you know, so many, there's so many people that are just hucksters you know in new york right and you know you sort of spot those people you know you learn to spot them really quickly and for us that have sort of been in that environment it's like wait a second you guys are buying this like it's just it's it's staggering i i'm just dumbfounded but it's uh, where we are it is where we are i just hope it's not the end of the country and uh, the end of our democracy, I should say, not the country, but, uh, oh, but you, it, guys will, it, you guys will have to make a record called American democracy instead of Chinese democracy. So, yeah, we'll that's, see. That's next. <laughs> hey, but if you get a chance, we give the, the Bernard Herman thing, you know, did you see the Brian De Palma um, documentary about his career? Um, no. and he, he talks about working with Bernard Herman on his films. Oh, really? So, yeah, it was really, it's fascinating. He's a fascinating oh, wow. character. So if you get a chance, watch that because I his, will. And you watch the cream documentary. I will do that. So I promise. So <laughs> thank you very much, dude. Thanks for your time. I know we had some um, hiccups doing this, so I appreciate it so much. It's so great to talk to you. Yes. It's great to catch up and I hope to see you somewhere in person soon. That would be wonderful. All right, my friend. Have All a right. great day. You will. You too. Well, that's our show this week. I hope you enjoyed it and maybe even learned a little something. 
to follow what's going on with this podcast, you can go to the radicalpod.com. Um, the radicalpod.com. You'll find show notes and past episodes and uh, even a little swag there if you want a t-shirt or a hat. Also, I would be honored if you'd subscribe at Apple or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Till next week. Till next week.